Hi, this is Paul. About a month ago, Bishop Barron released a video that said that Mrs. Davis was his favorite show. Mrs. Davis, currently streaming on the Peacock Network, is my favorite show. It's quirky as all get out, featuring a quest for the Holy Grail, an imprisoned pope, a journey inside the intestines of a whale, and an exploding head, don't ask, and a roller coaster of death. The lead character is a committed religious sister who regularly communes with Jesus and who manages more or less to save the world. Now, if you're looking to Mrs. Davis for theological precision, you will be severely disappointed. And please, do not write me letters reminding me how weird its theology is. I know, I know. <laughs> that should have been a tip-off to a number of us, because me, like a number of you, thought, oh, oh something, something interesting to watch on streaming. I'll give it a look. But there is indeed a spiritual motif of supreme importance that stands at the very heart of the show. And it's well worth plowing through all the intense weirdness to grasp it. It has to do with idolatry, and more precisely, with our tendency to create idols. The heroine of the story is Sister Simone, a member of a community of nuns who have purposely endeavored to live off of the grid, very much in the manner of the anchorites and monks from the ancient church who fled the corrupt civil society of their time. The grid in question is Mrs. Davis, who's not a person, but rather a massively powerful internet algorithm, an artificial intelligence which basically knows all that can be known and which can order and manipulate human beings at will. So pervasive is Mrs. Davis and so typically helpful that practically the entire human race has succumbed to her influence, gratefully doing her bidding and with childlike affection referring to her, depending on the country, as mother, mom, Madonna, and mama. She has most of the qualities that one classically associates with God. Virtual omnipotence, omnicompetence, omniscience, and even the capacity for providential guidance. And hence, again, it's no surprise that nearly everybody reveres her. But Sister Simone has intuited that Mrs. Davis, in point of fact, robs people of their independence, saps them of their energy and creativity, controls them ruthlessly, and finally dispenses with them when they no longer suit her purpose. She's come to see, to state it bluntly and simply, that the algorithm is an idol, a pathetic simulacrum of the true God, something that we have made and that has come like Frankenstein's monster to terrorize us. And so she lives happily with her rural community, venturing out into the world only to save hapless victims of Mrs. Davis's machinations. When colleagues express their dismay that the nun would stand to thwart her, she, the benevolent mother, Sister Simone grimly replies, not she, it. At the core of the drama is Sister Simone's quest to destroy Mrs. Davis, to turn it off and set people free. This is where the Holy Grail, the incarcerated Pope, and the whale come in, but I'll let you watch the program to understand just how. Now, the way he set this up, I was, wow, this sounds really very interesting, very... I just just sort of had some ideas about what it would be. And I, like many of you, because I asked on Twitter, and a number of you, including a number in this little corner, said, yeah, I started watching and then I quit. Or some of you said, yeah, I started watching and I was really disturbed. Now, again, he gave that disclaimer. Fair enough. And then I wondered, I thought, well, maybe... You know, after this disclaimer, he had second thoughts and he would back down. And so, just as I was preparing for this video, I discovered this. He, in fact, had a second video that released three days ago where he goes further. And, you know, this is, this is all very um, typical Bishop Barron in that he's well-spoken, he's very sharp, he's got great points. And... I found the show intriguing, but I also found the show disturbing. And, and even though he just made the point about the Pope and the Grail, almost made pass these things off as minor elements of the story, that the main story is really about Sister Simone versus Mrs. Davis, the algorithm. That's not really at all what the story is about, I don't think. Now, I, I, I don't really have anything... I don't have any bone to pick with just about anything Bishop Barron said about his points he derived from the story itself. But 
I've got a lot of questions about the story in its entire. Now, again, in both of these videos, he quite plainly states that he doesn't want, especially in the second videos, they don't want to give away any spoilers. I, I'm going to give away spoilers. Um, I don't know that even... I don't... I don't... With this kind of show, I don't even think that giving away spoilers are a problem. Now, there's another little thing that I've been touching on briefly, which is a little while ago, Thomas Flight made a, made a video about why do movies feel so different now. Um, Damian Walters, who I'm going to talk to in August because I got some vacation coming up and we can't really schedule it before that, uh, he did, he, he wants to sort of alter Thomas Flight's idea about metamodernism. Thomas Flight, in fact, has now done um, another modern modernism nostalgia. He's done another video, which I haven't watched yet, which is another one that I want to watch. So Bishop Barron makes the point in the second video. Of it, but... What got you hooked? How did you first hear about this, and why do you like this show? Oh, I, Father Steve is very good at, at like what's going on in the culture, and he had heard about this show, so he said, "How about you know one night we we watch it?" And um, you know, I was drawn in by so many elements of it. It is funny. It's deeply weird. It, it's a very postmodern show. You know how the postmoderns love what they call the bricolage approach. That you know, you take this from here and that from there, and this bit and this element and this part of religion and that part of the culture and and they kind of throw them all together. And Mrs. Davis is kind of like that kitchen sink uh, quality that's got all these different elements going on. But I think what got my attention, Brandon, was that the hero of the story is not Mrs. Davis. Mrs. Davis names an algorithm. The hero of the story is Sister Simone, who is a committed Catholic nun who lives in a community. And, and she is the heroine of the story. I mean, she's taking on... Uh, uh, the dark power and takes the heroic role, the self-sacrificial role. And she's presented not, not in a mocking way at all. She's presented and she presents herself. You know, when people call her by her, her secular name before she became a nun, she always corrects them. No, no, my name is Simone. I'm sister Simone. So that kind of got my attention. Like, okay, a Catholic nun. And what she's fighting is I think something very much worth fighting. <laughs> so probably those two things got my attention. She is fighting it, but the show is not just sort of set up as, you know, against the algorithm. And the algorithm is by no means, I think, portrayed as a big evil. And that this sort of gets into the C.S. Lewis, Paralandra, banality of evil type things too. Um, and whereas he says, well, it's sort of the bricolage postmodern, it's also in some ways deeply metamodern because now I've already had a number of people write me about the metamodern question. And my opinion on this word metamodern is that it's sort of what's what the language that we're using until the language solidifies for. If, if, if modernity was a view from above or a, a monarchical vision and um, it assumed a sort of vision of moral clarity, that, that morality was obvious, that its morality was obvious, of course, postmodernity comes around and sort of kicks the legs out from it, sort of like uh, Satan in the book of Job, Oh, your morality is only clear because it's self-serving for you. And so you have the hermeneutics of suspicion that sort of kicks the legs out from under it. And, you know, as, as many, including C.S. Lewis, had pointed out that you just keep doing that move, you, certain, you, you very quickly have no leg to stand on. And so meta-modernity meta wants to sort of come through again, not simply as modernity reasserting itself, but sort of coming around and saying, well, even if we're deeply skeptical about morality, uh, we, we are certainly going to, to live in it anyway. Um, certainty be damned, I'll have it my way, I'll have my, my morality my way, and because I need the feels, I need the meaning, 
postmodernity sit, simply yields nihilism, and I've I've got to have some sense of moral clarity and certainty. So, whether or not um, I imagine that the entire world is with me, it's my world, and welcome to it. And so, you know, very much recommend Thomas Flight's uh, Thomas Flight's video on it. And, I, I have to I have to watch his his next his next one too. Now, very much recommend these two videos that Bishop Barron has has put on it, um, and he goes through kind of standard questions that I would imagine sort of middle class middle brow, uh, nice church going people would ask with respect to it. But I just something in me just doesn't feel that way about this show. I too found the show in some respects deeply disturbing. I also found it sometimes hilarious. It's just knit together with inside jokes. It it's sort of written by people who, you know, they have they have a college degree and they know all the memes and the terms and they're just winking and telling jokes along the way and dealing with some things lightly. And so part of what I part of what I found disturbing about it was how lightly it dealt with things. And and one of the things that came up in this is um, some of the drama that went around Joshua Butler's recent new book. And I haven't, I haven't actually had any success in reaching out to Butler. I haven't tried that hard, but you know, maybe this fall I'll, I'll reach out to him and, and have him on the channel. And in some ways here in this Preston Sprinkle conversation that I've treated before a bit, you know, you have, you sort of have Sandy Richter and Brenna Blaine responding to this and Sandy Richter is kind of coming at Joshua Butler from an academic perspective, from a, let's say, a, an evangelical academic, a pretty standard evangelical academic perspective with, with an eye to um, defending um, women in, in egalitarian, uh, egalitarian evangelical spaces. Uh, and, and Brenna Blaine just coming at this out of a totally new place. And yeah, Brenna uh, Brenna Blaine is sort of coming at this out of the space that I think Mrs. Davis inhabits. Now, what you're about to see on the video for the next little while is this still. And the reason you're going to see this still is because I have not used this kind of material before a video before. And um, I'm not about to spend hours editing and trying to fight with the algorithm and see what I can get past. So in the future... Hopefully I can keep talking about this depending on what kinds of conversations we get back. Now, this little bit is not on the audio version because I didn't use any audio from Mrs. Davis and Peacock doesn't want me using any video from Mrs. Davis. So there isn't any video from Mrs. Davis in this video at all. So what you get is me in this silly position for the next little while just doing this. So if you want to look away, it's very boring TV. But uh, that's kind of what I had to do. And I'll figure out, you know, as, as I continue to chew on this and we'll see what the rest of the corner does with it. We'll, 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 figure, we'll figure this out. But that's why this video looks weird the way it does. Habits. Now, I'm going to run through at least the first episode and, and talk a little bit how this thing unfolds. And we, we'll, see how the, we'll see how the algorithm does with this. And there are lots of spoilers in this because if you watch all eight episodes, they're each they're each about an hour long, and there's only eight of them, so it's not hard to get through. That the show opens with, and and you kind of wonder, okay, what's what's this about? These men, you know, I've watched too much Oak Island to not hear about the Templars being executed, and of course that drives me back to the rest is history and a bunch of this stuff, and you know they're being. They're being executed for idolatry, and they're being burned, and this woman is watching, and she goes and she pulls these boots out of out of the fire, and of course you're you're sitting here watching. Well, okay, here's this this movie that we're watching about this the destruction of the Knights Templar, and then suddenly, well, they're looking for the Grail, 
they're looking for the grail. And these sisters here, um, you know, we assume, yeah, they've really got the grail and they're resisting oppression and they... Um, now, the Holy Grail, this, of course, sent me on my own quest for the Holy Grail, and the rest is history. Just did a very interesting episode on the Holy Grail, and I watched uh, Jonathan Peugeot and Richard Rowland's treatment of the Grail. And, and the Grail is, it's a myth, it's a legend, yes, but it's also kind of a stand-in for a whole bunch of things. And I thought the, I thought the, the rest is history treatment of it was, was really helpful. Uh, they approached it in a very different way than Jonathan Peugeot and Richard Rowland did. But it's very helpful in sort of understanding what, what arises in medieval Christianity as a... Uh, so, so now we have these strong female characters, and they're going to take up swords. And you see now they're all like ninjas with swords, and they're going to battle these guys. And, of course, um, they're they're misogynistic and... The women are going to let them have it, and so you have these, you have these warrior nuns who are doing their thing, and they're of course going to, you know, I mean, it's almost Galadriel all over again here, and of course, but they're they're not going to win in the end, and so you know, the young, she has to protect the Grail, run, take it to the west, and so um, now, and then, and then we cut to. Dr. Schrodinger and his cat. So we've got Knights Templars, we've got Ninja Nuns, we have Dr. Schrodinger and his cat. Yeah, there's a lot of those kinds of jokes throughout this thing. And Dr. Schrodinger has been marooned on an island, and he... Oh, okay, come on, work for me. And, and, of course, Dr. Schro Schrodinger's cat in a box. Now you've got kind of Dr. Schrodinger and his cat in a box. And he figures out a way to make a rocket. And the rocket's going to go up. And he's going to be saved. And he's all excited about this. So he gets rescued by this uh, container ship. And now he's introduced to the algorithm. Well, what, what is the algorithm? Well, I, I know what algorithms are. I'm a scientist. But um, she's talking to the algorithm. Uh, what's so sad? Now he f hears the news that everyone else in his crew was was um, dead. And and again, this is a really nice... Bishop Aaron really nails this right. This is a really nice introduction into Mrs. Davis. She is sort of omniscient, especially at the beginning, because there is a character arc to Mrs. Davis as well. There's a definite character arc to Mrs. Davis. And we found out a, we find out a bunch of kooky things, like she was sort of this... Um, she was originally supposed to be a marketing... Um, she was supposed to be a marketing app for Buffalo Wings, but the company didn't want so much, so she put it out on the internet, and other people developed it. And of course, Mrs. Davis, it's a it's a female. Okay, it's always female. It's Mrs. Davis. It's Mama. It's Madonna. It's very godlike. And again, the way Bishop Barron sold it, it sounded like the the real story is about Sister Simone versus Mrs. Davis, and that's true. But it's a lot more complex than that, and it's a lot less sort of heroic or classical than that. Now, that can be good or that can be bad. It is it is super complex, and I can see, you know, why he liked it, but I can also see why a lot of people were disturbed by it. So we have Dr. Schrodinger and his cat, and pretty soon we're going to be introduced to our hero, our heroine, Sister Simone, and we're going to be introduced to her in a very climactic way. So now, 11 minutes into the show, we're going to finally meet our heroine, Sister Simone. She's out by Reno, and we just first meet this dude traveling with their woman, and things are sort of sus, and then suddenly there's this, they're driving, they're driving, and they're going to go to some rendezvous, and yada, yada, yada. But there's a cow in the road, and they swerve off, and they crash under some sign. And, oh my goodness, the driver is decapitated! And, oh no, 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 and then the cops are there, and then he doesn't want to be in this scandal because of his family. They only just met. 
and then someone comes riding in on a white horse. And, well, if you saw the, the Bishop Baron trailer, it's Sister Simone. And she explains that these are magicians, and magicians are, are, are doing graft. And he, um, yeah, so it's all, it's all a big setup, and they're promised to pay them off. They're con artists. Are they con artists? Worse. Dum dum dum. They're magicians. <laughs> now that's important because when you finally get into the backstory of Sister Simone, she was raised by a magician. Her father was a magician and her mother was a scientist. And it wasn't a very happy marriage. Okay, then you get into so she's got this this white horse that she loves, and she rides in to save people on a white horse. Um, oh, not she, it. Again, that, that gets that gets emphasized. And then suddenly we find Sister Simone, and she's with, she's in this restaurant, and the dude's cooking, and they're talking about his food, and, um, and she's explaining everything to him, and he's just, he's just, just the perfect... Um, he's the perfect nice guy. And and they laugh about his food. But then there's something mysterious. You get, he basically is the one setting up targets for her to rescue. And they come along, like in the short order cook, they come along there. And oh, here's the next target. Oh, it's blank. Well, what, what, do you, what do you mean it's blank? Well, that's weird. And it's never blank. Um, there's always a name. I just put the ticket on the carousel, Simone. It's the boss behind the door. And so, well, who's the boss behind the door? Employee entrance, do not enter. And, and right away you get the sense that, well, you know, she and the guy are tight and he's cool, but there's someone behind that door. And for a lot of the show, you sort of think, well, it's a Trinitarian thing. But kinda someone is behind the door and I'll, I'll leave that I'll leave that go because that's sort of more of a genuine thing and then you get to the then you get to the the uh, the sisters and they're uh, they, they've got a lot of water for this valley in Nevada I'll tell you and they're growing strawberries and well they're making strawberry preserves and they play sports and well you know part of what's really interesting in this is that, how can I say this? So often in media, the religious people have to be cool, and they have to be cool in a certain way. And now we're to the point that all of this, a lot of the sort of tyrannical religious things, like back in the 60s and 70s, if you were to see nuns, with the exception of um, Sally Fields and the Flying Nun, Nuns, they could be mean and they'd wrap your fingers. Think about think about the Blues Brothers and the Penguin. And, and so you just sort of watch these, these stereotypes in the culture. But, you know, this is, here you have these sisters and they're all sort of nerdy in their own religious way, but benign but nerdy and everybody's there voluntarily and there's no dirty dealings, but... They're all a little bit simple, and then they celebrate her birthday, and, you know, she has real community. They're all there for her birthday, and, um, and, and now there's, there's, there are a lot of Sound of Music um, little inside jokes going on. In fact, there's one scene where she's even just like kind of on a hillside twirling like, like Maria, and so then she's going to, after all the hullabaloo about the birthday... Uh, she's going to have her little sit down with Mother Superior. And there's a man. Yes, I do. Um, but there's no sex involved, at least not in the traditional sense. Of course, well, she's, you know, like she's married to Jesus. So, you know, and again, uh, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit raucous and off color and all of that. And. Um, yeah, her, and so then you, you begin to get the sense that, well, you don't really know it yet. And then they have this mysterious episode where there's a woman in a helicopter and we all wonder what's going on about that. And later on in the show, you'll figure it out. 
And then all the sisters have to go and deliver their jam. And again, it's all just like, these are the nice kinds of religious people because they do things like make jam. And they make really good jam because their moral purity means that it's all organic. And, well, don't ask where they're getting all this water in the desert by Reno. But, um, and they tell, the, the, she tells, the Mother Superior gives them very strict instructions, no stops. Which, of course, you know then, they're going to make a stop. And, well, somebody's sort of fooling them. And then there's these mangoes that are coming. And again, some real super nice guy they have these these mango ices and but it's oh there's something there's something sinister going on behind the scenes and in a minute there's going to be this weird situation where somebody has a giant magnifying glass and see this is where you begin and and again the the ai stuff is really pretty cool because do you remember Pokemon Go or sort of like augmented reality where you could hold up your phone and it would the, the image would come in and you'd see everything out there, but then there'd be little cartoon characters. Now Google is doing this with their virtual reality, augmented reality thing that they announced and and that's gonna come. And so this this Mrs. Davis and this app that's all over the world and everyone's smartphone, basically, again, this is loads of spoilers. Basically, if you do, again, there's, there's a ton that's clever about this. If you, the whole purpose of the app, later in the show you'll learn by the app designer because you meet the designer. So there's some matrixy stuff about it because you meet the app designer. And of course, the, the benevolent app designer isn't a man. And he's certainly not a white man. But um, you meet the benevolent app designer. And the idea was when people do, they're given missions from, Ms., from Mrs. Davis. They're given missions and they're like these altruistic missions. And, you know, and a little bit later in the show, there's a very clear place where everybody understands there's a meaning crisis. And the purpose of Mrs. Davis is to give people altruistic, beneficial missions so that they have meaning in life and they do good things and all of those things that Bishop Barron mentioned, that wars would end, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, even though they also admit in the show that wars haven't ended and somehow everybody's just too distracted with their little phones not to recognize that wars haven't really ended. But And so in that way... The frame that Bishop Barron gives isn't technically incorrect, but the more you watch the show, it's incomplete. And in, in that way, in a sense, the show has a little bit more depth, but it's not necessarily very happy or good depth. So she's getting distracted. They've made their stop. They shouldn't have made their stop. Now some mysterious evil man and is going to see here's the he's focusing this giant beam against the strawberries and you know it's never it's it's always sort of implied that mrs davis was out to get the nuns but later what we learn about mrs davis she she really wouldn't have any reason to get these nuns because what mrs davis wants the nuns aren't really doing anything against what Mrs. Davis wants, and so why are they destroying all of this? Well, is it just to get her attention? Now she's going to try and Judas Priest chase chase down the guy. He runs her off the road, but now she's ticked off because Mother Superior comes back and basically says, "The we've always lost money. We've never turned a profit." All of you sisters are going to go off into other places in the world and do good things. And so right there, there's a tension. Because in some ways, the church and Mrs. Davis are kind of in the same business. And they, you know, because the sons are, the nuns are getting sent all over the world to do all these altruistic things. And what Mrs. Davis is doing with this sort of re- crowdsourced, rearranged AI Buffalo Wings app is sending people all over the world to do a bunch of different good things. But now bear in mind, you've still got a Vatican plot 
and you've still got the Holy Grail out there. And so uh, Sister Simone isn't having any of these things, so they're getting a gift card to do their travel, and one woman's supposed to go out and you know help some donkeys. And Sister Simone, you're going to go to Bermuda. Um, there's an orphanage, but again, she's not having it. Um, she's got to say goodbye to her horse. Mm, is she going to get on this bus? Is she going to go there? Um, and then, and here's the creepy thing. And this is done really well for the most part that Mrs. Davis has a personal, takes personal interest in individuals. Now, with our AI, you know, Amazon, Google, they have a personal interest in us to the degree that they can market to us. And, and sort of early on, the implicit thing is that there's a personal interest in her because it wants to get her onto the AI thing and she's resisting. So you have these beauty queen daughters come up and um, will you take our family picture? Oh, but there's actually a plot. People are, you know, they've, <laughs> these Germans, oh, I feel for the Germans. It's always the Germans. Um, they're they're going to trank her and they're going to kidnap her. But again, nothing is as it appears. Um, and then some, suddenly someone's going to come to rescue her. And again, it's quirky. And they're coming in sort of an exterminator mobile with a giant bug on. And they're there to rescue her. And then whoop, who swoops in but... Her old boyfriend, the boyfriend that she left for Jesus. Now, it isn't really revealed yet what's really going on with sort of the prayer life. And so here's the rainbow helmet. Get on and I'm going to rescue you. And so and then the, the chase scene is super silly. And then they basically give them the slip out in the desert. And then he reveals to her that he has founded a an organization that's going to resist Mrs. Davis and everything that's going on. And while we had all of the women, the nice women out there in the desert making strawberry preserves, the dudes have their own... Oh, now, now, the whole Jesus thing, it's like she just closes her eyes and then she's, you know, in communion with Jesus... Uh, there's, there's a lot of um, little things going on. There's a water thing, sort of like Inception. So there's undertones of Inception in here. And uh, let's see. And then she has to go. She's finally going to go have the showdown with, with Mrs. Davis. And the person that's going to channel Mrs. Davis is a kindergarten teacher in the school that she went to when she was young. And then all this stuff, you have to sit in the circle and you've been chosen. What have you been chosen? And, and so here, Mrs. Davis is both kind of a proxy for God and a proxy for the church because they're sort of doing the same things. And, and again, so there's this, there's this implicit idea of God. Now, now, I think in some ways this is helpful. I, again, I'm, I understand why Bishop Barron and... I mean, I, I imagine he's living with um, other priests and wherever he's living, and they have their community there, and why they sat down and watched all this stuff. Um, she's going to speak through me. And so, you know, again, there's sort of a an evangelical, the Spirit's going to speak through me. And this is, again, this is very interestingly done. Um, like a ventriloquist? No, that's not very nice, Simone. Um, and so the, the school teacher stuff. Um and of course, everybody is, has to be forgiven because they want to earn these wings that can be seen through, there's the app. And you have the little clues that it's the buffalo wings. And you've been given a present. And the present is a card. But again, now remember, and we don't know this yet in the story, remember she was raised by magicians. So she's cynical. And, I, and again, you can, and I'm really anxious to hear what more people if more people watch this in the corner, um, what they see in this, because there's lots of things here. 
And so in some ways, I mean, you can run with this thing in a lot of different ways. So Sister Simone, she sort of takes the religious route, you know, not unlike a lot of people in the corner, but she's deeply cynical. She was raised by, she was raised by two sides of skeptic, an enchanted skeptic, which is a stage magician and an engineer and who didn't get along. So those are her parents. Okay. And so she's got a message and what she's supposed to do is she's supposed to get the holy, she's supposed to find the holy grail. And, um, yeah, there, there's a line that gets repeated. Wishes are for little girls. Remember, she's raised by a, um, a fake enchanter and an engineer. So there's lots and lots and lots of layers to this thing. But, but unlike, let's say, finding symbolism in, um, in Tolkien or in a fairy tale where you sort of have a world that it might have its dark and light side, this world just feels like clown world. And it's clown world in that it isn't just bad and evil. Even the evil is supposed to be altruistic, but it's not, you have a sense that this really isn't the world anyone wants to live um, and so basically she the world anyone wants to live. Um, and so basically she makes a bargain here that she says, look, if I do your mission, if I get the Holy Grail, then well, my, then, then she'll, Mrs. Davis will do whatever she asks. Well, I'm going to tell you to shut yourself off. And then the question is, will Mrs. Davis shut herself off? And I won't give you all the spoilers, but so, so right away you have a sense that, okay, we have a knight errand for the Holy Grail. She's been cast out of Camelot. I mean, you can take this at lots of different layers. And I know that sort of throwing this out to the corner, a bunch of you are going to take this and run with it. And I'm really kind of curious what you're going to do with it. So that's why I wanted to do this video. And I you know, depending, I've got some vacation coming up and so videos are going to stop, especially these kind of videos are going to stop. My wife has some crazy idea for me to do other kinds of videos while we're on vacation. So if they're just weird and, and personal and stuff, I'll probably just put them in the membership area um, where I'll probably put videos that I think, well, I don't know if I dare show this to the world. I'll just show this to the members. And right now I think there's 31 or 32 members at different levels. I'm also going to talk to, I know a lot of people have talked about merch and wanted merch. And I'll, usually I'm like, I don't want to bother with merch. But my sister's been doing a lot of different kinds of merch. And then I thought, what would it be like to have a, this little corner shower curtain? Uh, what it would be to have some caps. I'm not really so interested in just t-shirts and hoodies, although we could do that too. But kind of interested in some other quirky kinds of merch. So I might do that for some of the members. Again, this whole membership thing, I'm just kind of playing around with it. And a bunch of people have... So there's like a $3 a month level, which kind of gets you in the door. And then there's like a $7 a month level, which gets you more stuff. And then there's this... I couldn't believe when Google's like, these are the best three levels to have. And I thought, all right, I'll give it a try. And I'm going to have to do something big for you, $25 a month level people. Um, I'm sure there'll be a one-on-one -on -one conversation or something like that. I don't know what I'll do, but I'm, I'm just playing around with this stuff. So I wanted to give an introduction and a few more teasers and stuff to Mrs. Davis because, again, I, you know, I don't, I don't quite know what to think. I don't quite know what to think about Mrs. Davis Bishop Barron's take on Mrs. Davis. On one hand, everything he said is true. And he's, but... I clearly was just kind of a little... I wasn't deceived, but my it certainly didn't follow my expectations. And he could say, you know, he could say off-color and nerdy and all of those things, but... You know, and, and in talking to a number of you, I know a number of you also found it disturbing. And I kind of want to figure out what's disturbing us about it. So, 
So I'm throwing it out to you, and I'm anxious to see what you all do with it. I'm really curious what uh, I, and Grim Grizz probably doesn't have Peacock, and it's it's just on streaming. So um, yeah, I'm really curious what y'all are gonna do with it. So yeah, let me know. We'll see. I'm really curious to see what you're gonna do with it. Leave a comment. Make a video.